and to love our neighbor. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear this word of assurance. The Bible says that the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And in Jesus, God has given us that grace, mercy, and love, lavished it on us. In fact, from Jesus' cross flows pardon for sin and power to start again. Thanks be to God. Our next praise is really a response to God's pardon. It's meant to release us to sing. I know we still have to restrain ourselves, but we do stand to sing number 466 in the Book of Praise, Praise the Lord with the Sound of Trumpet. lesson this morning is from the Old Testament. It's from the first book of Samuel, chapter 1, and that is on page 190 in your pew Bibles. The birth of Samuel. There was a certain man from Marathim, a Sufite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jehoiada, <coughs> the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zeph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah, and the other, Hanana. 
Hannah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever they came for Elkanah to sacrifice, whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Panana, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. When, whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why won't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. I would now ask if you would join me in the responsive reading, which is Psalm 51. And that can be found on page 405 of your Peter. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, for so you are right in your birth, and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the heart, you teach me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear your joy and gladness, let the bones of you crush rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me out from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. You've heard already a prayer from Hannah. You just heard and spoke of a prayer from David. We're now going to read of two other prayers in our New Testament reading. Um, so that you're clued in, we're in the middle of a four-part sermon series on prayer. Um, last week we talked about prayer as adoration, this week prayer as confession. So we turn now to our New Testament reading, which is Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, and we'll read verses 9 to 14. And that reading can be found on page 742 in your Pew Bible. 
Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 9. Just before I continue, can you hear me okay? Good, thank you. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our hymn is 194, Come let us to the Lord our God, and we sing verses 1, 2, and 3, and verse 6. his profits by thinning down his paint with turpentine in order to make it go further. He got away with this for a very long time until he got a job painting the outside walls of a church. Up on the scaffolding, with paintbrush in hand, and with the job nearly complete, Jack heard thunder which was quickly followed by torrential rain. Rain that washed Jack's thin down paint right off the church walls. Convinced that the storm was a sign of God's judgment on his cheating, Jack cried, God, I want to confess. 
What should I do? And from the thunder Jack heard these words, repaint, repaint, and thin no more. <laughs> Today's sermon title is Prayer as Confession. Prayer as Confession. Some people, of course, never pray. Never pray prayers of confession or any other because they simply do not believe that there's a God who hears prayer. They say that we live in a, as, as orphans in a godless world. But even those of us who do believe that God exists and that God hears prayer, even we sometimes are reluctant to pray. For instance, those who imagine God to be a stern, sullen deity will usually keep out of his way. And those who imagine God to be a soft, indulgent deity may well ask for this and that, but otherwise ignore him. The God whose character the Bible reveals is neither sullen nor soft. He's the creator of all that's good, who seeks nothing but your good, and for our good sent Jesus Christ. As we noted last Sunday, we acknowledge God's goodness, God's love, and God's power in prayers of adoration. We do that every Sunday morning. That's the opening prayer at St. Andrew's Church and many others, prayer of adoration. But today, we focus on prayer as confession, which is the second prayer we pray every Sunday at this church and in many others. What is prayer as confession? It's the sort of prayer in which we acknowledge before God who we are, Prayer of adoration confesses and acknowledges who God is. Prayers of confession acknowledge who we are. It's not always easy. It's not always easy because we don't even like to admit to ourselves sometimes some of the stuff that's going on inside our lives. And so in front of others, we try to present our best self. I told my sister, I'm going to try to present all the Irish charm I possibly can in this congregation. <laughs> we try to present our best self, and we try to hide our worst self. And we often wear masks to do that. By the way, I'm not making a comment on what you're wearing this morning. <laughs> I'm not saying that we need to fully reveal ourselves to everybody. Thankfully, we don't have to do that, but we do have to come clean, to be honest with somebody. Prayer as confession requires that we are honest with God. But even with God, we often prefer to wear a mask. But if we do, God will seem distant. And prayer will ultimately feel unreal. By way of contrast to that, I want to go back to the prayer of Hannah that we read in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Hannah was miserable. She was miserable because her husband had two wives, one of whom had a brood of children, but she had none. Even worse, the other wife constantly threw it in Hannah's face, her inability to conceive. And that was revealed in the text in words like rival, weeping, bitterness. You read those words. What do we do? What do we do with stuff like that in our lives? Many of us put on a happy face when inside we're miserable. Many of us pretend to be perfect when inside we feel like a failure. We all do that. Sometimes clergy may be more than others. 
if we try to keep all that stuff hidden from God, a real relationship with God will become impossible. Hannah's relationship with God, however, was real. She went to the temple, and there she went in a, to, to pray a particular type of confession. She went to confess her misery. She went to tell God all the awful things she felt inside. And the things that life was doing to her. She, and the wonderful thing, it's not mentioned in the text, but it's implied. She trusted God with her honest feelings. Believing that God is the sort of God, the sort of compassionate God, who can, can put up with us, even with our warts. My point is this. God can cope with you. Believe me. God can cope with you. Whatever is going on inside your life. God can cope with you and with me. In fact, it's only if we feel sure that God loves us and that God always seeks our good that we'll actually trust him and bring to him in prayer our secrets and maybe even our shameful secrets. That's what's required when we think about prayer as confession. To believe that God loves you warts and all and nothing you can tell him will ever turn him away from you. Prayer then, as I said last Sunday, begins by acknowledging who God is. Gracious, abounding in steadfast love. But prayer also requires that we acknowledge who we are. In his gift, and sorry, in his book, The Gift of Being Yourself, David Benner writes these words. He says, he says, the self that God persistently loves is not my prettied up pretend self, but my actual self, the real me. If so, if so, we don't have to hide from ourselves. We don't have to hide from others, and we don't have to hide from God. We don't have to present ourselves in the most flattering light. We don't have to manipulate others in order to try and force them to like us. We don't have to try to impress God. Prayer as confession requires honesty. By way of illustration, I want to go back to the two prayers we read in Luke chapter 18, where we find Jesus' parable about two men going to the temple in Jerusalem to pray. We know that story so well. One was a Pharisee, so convinced of his own goodness that he simply looked down on everybody else and despised them. His prayer went like this. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers are like that tax collector in the back row. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I've got. And on he went. He was trying to impress God. But that man's prayer lacked, totally lacked honesty and humility and self-insight. It revealed no need of God whatsoever. The other man in Jesus' parable was the opposite. He was so convinced of his sin that he wouldn't look up to heaven. He sat in the back seat of the church and beat his breast. His prayer went like this, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. His prayer was both honest and humble. That reminds me of a story I once heard about 
a minister asking a congregation, if there's anybody here who's not a sinner, please stand up. Nobody did, of course, except the one man in the back row. I keep looking down here. And when, he, when this man stood up, the minister said, you mean you've never sinned? To which the man replied, uh, no, I'm a sinner, but I'm standing in for my wife's first husband. <laughs> I like that. Prayer as a confession requires honesty, but it also requires humility. It requires the humility to know, to have enough self-insight that we realize our need of God and our need of God's forgiveness. This goes against my grain. I don't know about you, but it goes against my grain. I have my life together. Compared with someone saying, ah, my life looks good. You know the sort of way we do, we say. I'm at least as good as the next guy. What have I got to confess? And so, and so we excuse ourselves or justify ourselves. I once heard about a minister who, using a bicycle to visit his congregation, met a boy with a lawnmower for sale. How much do you want for the mower? Asked the minister. The boy said, I want enough money to buy a bicycle. Oh, said the minister, maybe we should just trade. Well, the boy said, fine, I'll trade, but let me try out the bicycle first. He rode it around, it was fine. And he said, mister, you've got a deal. Then the minister then took the lawnmower and tried to start it by pulling on the cord. Nothing happened. He tried again, nothing happened. And so he went to the boy and he complained. And the boy said, look, you have to cuss at it before it'll start. And the minister replied, but I'm a minister. I can't do that. It's so long since I cussed, I don't know how. The boy's response was this, if you keep pulling at that cord, it'll come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> if only that was our, if, I, if only that was the only thing we had to confess. But it isn't. It isn't. Whether we like to admit it or not, sin is a power that poisons, in some way, it poisons all our lives. In the last two weeks, I need not tell you, we've been appalled by reminders of how Canada has treated its indigenous people. Who's to blame? Well, many are now pointing to John A. Macdonald or to Edgerton Ryerson or somebody else. And they're now demanding that their statute, statues be taken down from public view. But what we so conveniently ignore is that those leaders acted as they did because of the overwhelming support they had from the Canadian public. Racist, racist attitudes, social prejudice, the dismissal of others as lesser breeds. None of this is confined to a few. It often dwells in the hearts of the many. Prayer as confession demands that we are humble enough to examine our own lives, our own attitudes and thoughts. And then, as we find King David doing in Psalm 51, which we read, then coming to God and confessing, Lord, as I look truly at myself, blot out my transgressions, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me, from my sin. Do you ever feel that your life isn't what it should be? That it's impacted by envy or bitterness or anger, compromised by what you ought to have done but didn't, or compromised by something you said that you shouldn't have done? 
sabotaged by a malevolent power in your life or in the congregation or in the community. When we feel bad about ourselves, or maybe I'm just speaking for myself, perhaps instead of eating more or drinking more or buying more, we ought, like King David of old, to examine ourselves. After doing that, David in Psalm 51 confessed to God the lust, the selfishness, the narcissism, the duplicity that stained his life. It's not an easy thing to do, which is why we sometimes are reluctant to pray prayers of confession. It led David to weep to become broken in spirit by what he found within himself. And so he cries out in Psalm 51, verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me. And you discover it's the very same text. It's the very same words. It's the very same prayer that the tax collector prayed in the temple in Luke 18. Whether king or commoner, we, every one of us, need the humility to confess our sins to God and ask for forgiveness. And when we do, we discover just how wonderfully gracious God is. But the thing is, we live in an age that dismisses talk of sin and dismisses guilt as a throwback to some old-fashioned age. And I think people are kidding themselves. Listen to the news every day. Every day, news of violence, theft on a grand scale, rich people ripping off the poor, sexual impropriety, social bullying, and on it goes. Now, it's true, of course, that none of you here this morning, as far as I know, are guilty of the horrific murders in London this week. Nor are most of us social bullies or sexual deviants. And yet we are all impacted by sin. Guilty of sin, not least the sins of speech by which we practice half-truths, gossiping, you name it. It's no wonder that in Psalm 51, David names sin as a destructive power that's at work in his life and has been at work in his life from the day he says that since I was born. Now, when we have the honesty and humility to admit things that are wrong in our lives, we sometimes beat ourselves up. But that's not what the Bible calls us to do. It calls us to bring our honesty and humility to God in a prayer of confession. That we come to God just as we are, without one plea. And to lay our lives before God, to acknowledge our need of God and believing that God has mercy for us. We'll do that. We'll do that if we're confident, if we are confident that it is through Jesus' sin-bearing death that God's pardon is offered to us. Cleanse me with hyssop, wrote David, confidently, and I'll be clean. Wash me, he said, confidently, and I'll be whiter than snow. That's good news. And prayers of confession lead us, finally, to God's answering good news. Be clean. Be clean. I'm going to end with a story from a book called Prayer by Richard Foster. He tells of a friend walking through a shopping mall with his two-year-old son. The child turned really cantankerous, noisy, started, you know what two-year-olds can do. His father tried everything to quieten his little son, but nothing helped. Then, under some special inspiration, the dad scooped up his little boy and, holding him close, began singing him an impromptu love song. None of the words rhymed. He sang off-key. But the words went something like this. I love you. I'm so glad you're my boy. You make me happy. 
I like the way you laugh. And on they went from one store to the next, the father singing off key and making up words that didn't rhyme. The child relaxed and became still, listening to the strange, wonderful song being sung by his dad. Finally they finished shopping and went to the car. And as the father buckled his little boy into his car seat, the child lifted up his head and said, Sing it to me again, Daddy. Sing it to me again. God knows you through and through, and me. God knows our waywardness and our warts. But you know what? God has a wonderful song that he sings for every one of you. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we have no way to measure your love for us, your mercy, your goodness. So vast that it covers all that's wrong with us. We are so thankful for that and give you our praise through Jesus Christ.
to express our appreciation for all that God means to us. That's why we give. And your offering will now be received. Today we have real ushers doing that. Um, so that will take place right now. And when we're ready, we'll sing the first verse of 661, which is we give, uh, we give thee but thy all. <coughs> thanksgiving and supplication. And in the prayer of thanksgiving, you'll hear me use the phrase, this day, O God. After that phrase, I invite you to respond with, we praise your name. Let us pray. Generous God, overflowing in love and blessing. We bring to you our thanks for Jesus, who lived, who died, and who rose again to redeem us and to make us your own people. This day, O oh God, we praise your holy name for your consistent goodness and gentleness, patiently leading us and correcting us. This day, O oh God, we praise your name for the worldwide church made up of men and women and children of every race that you have called to know, to know you. This day, O oh God, we, we praise, praise your name. For the common graces of life, the capacity to think and to create and to care, for memories of the past and, and friends to accompany us in the present, this day, O oh God, we, we praise, praise your name. name. For solid hope in Jesus Christ, who remains faithful to us through all the dis disappointments of life, this day, O oh God, we praise your name. And now we pray for others. We pray for our world. Lord, internationally there's much to concern us and to grieve you. We think of faraway places where life is short and brutish and where children do not have the chance to flourish. We pray particularly for those, for millions of children in Africa, orphaned by the AIDS pandemic. 
Lord, create in us, we pray, a Jesus-like compassion that moves us to join and to protect those in need and to protect those who are bullied because of their creed or colour. We pray for our nation. Lord, help our leaders to use political, economic and military power to help those who are oppressed. Give them the discernment to move beyond partisanship to seek justice, not only in Canada but around the world. We also pray that new technology and methodologies will help to restore the damage we inflict on our environment, your creation. We pray for the worldwide church. Lord, help us as Christians to value one another across this vast world and our own vast country. Help us to support the work of the gospel in remote locations and to invest in the preparation of church leaders who will faithfully proclaim Jesus in all his meekness and majesty. And Lord, for ourselves in our own congregation, we pray that it will be filled with your life and love such that we can be a community of salt and light that witnesses to you. And finally, we pray for ourselves. Lord, some of us join worship today full of life, happy to see this day. Others are worried and worn. Merciful God, you know the burdens we carry. Provide rest to the weary, faith for seekers, friends for the lonely, comfort for those in pain. And help all of us to turn to you, forgiving God, and find the life and the love that we cannot find in any other place. Lord, hear our prayers through Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn is number 682 in the hymn book. We'll sing the first four verses of Just As I Am, without one plea.
wants to say one final word of blessing on your life. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the comfort and fellowship of God's Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Thank you.